Let's give it about uh, maybe three more minutes and we'll get going. <clears throat> Dr. Pass, we're seeing your prevent presenter view. Oh, really? Mm, thank you. Let's see if I can fix that. Okay, let's see if I can. I think I have an idea how to fix that. Did, did, did that work? Yes. Thank you very much. Appreciate the advice. Thank you for letting me know. Good morning, Sergey and Dave. Good morning, Dr. Pass. Good morning. We'll give it another minute or two and then we'll get going. Oops. Hey, Prerna, Neha, good morning. Good morning, Dr. Ben. Good morning. I'm going to give it one or two more minutes and then we'll get going in case there's any missing. One, two, three, four, five, six. Actually, we're all here, so we may as well just go ahead. Okay. Uh, so today we're going to do a little bit of a potpourri. Somebody asked me this past week, uh, actually somebody from Australia, if we would be willing to review a little bit on atrial electrograms, so in the ICU type setting. So I thought I would do a little bit of, a little bit on arrhythmia and a little bit on atrial electrograms since it's early in the year, probably helpful for particularly for David and Sergey. So this is a one-year-old uh, who has a history of tetralogy um, and uh, is following <coughs> surgery in the immediate post-op period. And um, this is an example of an esophageal lead, which is similar to an atrial electrogram, except it's different in that the esophagus, you can actually record both the ventricle and the atrium from. Um, as opposed to an atrial lead, which is obviously sewn to the atrium and theoretically should only be recording largely the atrium. Um, although some of you may be aware that when we put pacemaker leads in the atrium, particularly transvenous leads that are in the right atrial appendage, it's not uncommon to have a, a so-called far field ventricular electrogram because of the fact that the atrial, uh, because the atrial appendage hangs over the RV outflow tract. Uh, and so it can pick up some far field V, but the esophagus is sitting immediately behind the left atrium and is a nice way to record off the atrium. And so this is what these, uh, this investigator or uh, clinician did. So Grace, maybe you can tell me, what are you seeing in the esophageal lead? Um, uh, I've labeled the V's and the A's just so that you understand which is which, but I will remind you that the lead two that is underneath the esophageal lead is simultaneous with the esophageal lead. So you can tell what the QRS is. Mm -hmm. So it looks like the QRS is coinciding with the V's and you can also see that there are, um, the V is quick, faster than the A mm -hmm. and that they are dissociated Right. Uh, so I would think, especially given the history of TEP, that this is jet. Well, that would certainly be a, a, a good guess. Um, and you are, as usual, correct. So um, 
just so that, you know, we're, since we're early in the year, let's just go over some of the simpler stuff. So JET is a, we, we talked about two weeks ago in the, in the EP lecture about automatic and reentrant arrhythmias. So JET is a very common automatic postoperative arrhythmia. It's seen mostly following surgeries where there's a VSD or a tetralogy type surgery, but it can be seen in any intracardiac repair. And it is generally believed to be due to uh, injury to the His bundle with, um, uh, you know, uh, some kind of enhanced automaticity due to perhaps aggressive manipulation of the His bundle or some sutures that are very close to the His bundle, some kind of an injury there. Um, it is an automatic arrhythmia, meaning that it heats up and cools down. So it is very uncommon that a patient just has an abrupt onset of jet. Usually the classic story is that a patient uh -huh. comes back from the operating room in sinus okay. rhythm. And then um, hear her, but... guys, just as an FYI, I can hear uh, people talking. Probably, so yeah. if you could possibly, uh, if you could possibly um, uh, just mute yourself, I'd appreciate it. Thanks so much. So anyway, um, it is a, uh, there's no abrupt onset and offset, and it is very catecholamine sensitive. So when you're looking at the heart rate trend in someone with JET, what I was uh, saying earlier is that typically patients will come back from the OR in sinus rhythm, but slowly they will develop this arrhythmia over the first hour to three hours, and they start getting faster and faster. Uh, again, it can be immediately seen in the post-op period, but it typically happens and worsens over the first two to four hours post-op. And it is the lack of AV synchrony and the shorter filling times due to tachycardia that likely cause the hemodynamic embarrassment that we see with JET. And uh, clinically, this is associated with decreased urine output, lower cardiac output, worsening respiratory status, and oftentimes uh, metabolic acidosis. And so um, this is an important arrhythmia. And until the last two to three decades, uh, it was not really well understood how to manage or treat this. And this was actually a fairly common cause of death following open heart surgery because of a lack of understanding. And in fact, even though I've only been practicing as an attending for 23 years, at the start of my career, for example, it was believed that digoxin was a, a requirement of treatment of JET. And in fact, if you tried to treat JET with any therapy, but you did not include digoxin, you were considered to be doing the wrong thing. And uh, remember when I first started in my first job at Columbia, having to uh, start that in everybody, even though I was using more modern approaches, but Dig always had to be on board. Uh, let's go to the next slide here, if I can. Here we go. I don't know why. There we go. Okay. So uh, in JET, the ventricular rate is equal to or greater than the atrial rate. And the differential diagnosis of the ventricular rate being greater than the or equal to the A rate is always going to be VT or JET. So when you see a ventricular rate that's basically greater than the atrial rate or equal to the atrial rate um, without AV association or with an unusual, that's not sinus rhythm, I should just say, then it's almost certainly either VT or JET. That's your differential diagnosis. Uh, and it's important to remember that in JET, you can have uh, AV or VA dissociation or association. Oftentimes in books, people talk about the fact that JET is associated with AV or VA dissociation, then it's not always true. There are many young people have ventriculoatrial conduction. And so the absence of association between the V's and the A's, or I should say the, the presence of association between the V's and the A's does not rule out the presence of JET. Okay. So um, why don't we go to uh, David? So David, uh, it, uh, Grace Kong, the second year fellow, just told us that it was her impression that this was JET. I actually think she's right, but um, we just talked about the fact that when you have more Vs than As, this could be JET, but it could also be VT. So is there any way that you could think of that you'd be able to prove whether this is JET or VT? 
Uh, I think that Jet would more likely to have narrow complex um, QRS. That's a very good point you raise. Certainly that's true. However, for example, in a patient who's had a tetralogy repair, it's not uncommon, right, to have a bundle branch block. Um, and so sometimes the sinus QRS could be fairly wide in a post-op patient. So I agree with your general statement that generally JET, right, JET has the same QRS morphology as the conducted or sinus QRS. Uh, why is that, David? Why, why you, you actually just said earlier that the QRS is normally narrower in JET. Why is that? Because it that, that is true. Down. It conducts on the normal Hiss-Purkinje system. That's right, because the other term for JET is Hiss-Bundle tachycardia. In Europe, I believe that's a more commonly used term to describe it. And so it's believed that the Hiss-Bundle is firing more rapidly. And because you're conducting from the Hiss down the right and left bundles, the QRS should look fairly similar, if not exactly similar, to the sinus QRS. So you're right. In general, JET is more narrow, but I think it would be more proper to say that in JET you have your usual QRS rather than necessarily a narrow QRS. So in this case, the QRS is, is this a narrow or a wide QRS for a one-year-old? It looks, um, I would say wide for a one-year-old. Yeah, I would agree with that statement. So, uh, but as we just said, following a tetralogy repair, it, it's, not, it's not inconceivable, right, that the QRS may look like this because of uh, an injury to one of the bundles in the process of either putting a, a, a ventriculotomy or a VSD patch or something along those lines. So, um, so is there any other way other than the morphology of the QRS in spontaneous rhythm that you could tell whether or not this is JET or VT? Um, what about the rate? Um, okay, that's a good good point. So, uh, what are you? What's your point you're trying to make? Um, what is what is typical of the rates of jet or VT? I would say maybe the jet is slower, one um, fifties maybe, um, and the VT could be potentially faster. Well, uh, you know, I I don't think I would agree with that uh, because basically either could be anything and. Uh, Generally speaking, JET is, there's different definitions of textbooks about JET. I think some of the textbooks will say if your rate is above 180 and you're in a junctional rhythm, uh, that that is JET. Other people will say that JET is any junctional rhythm that is associated with hemodynamic embarrassment. Um, so it's hard to know, but I, I think as a general rule, uh, JET patients are usually fairly fast. Uh, this is not off. This is not very fast, but it's, it's not slow either. Um, so what I'm trying to get at here is that we have atrial wires. And so when somebody is in jet, uh, it's often the case that it's useful to pace the atrium. Now, there are many reasons why pacing the atrium in somebody in jet is of benefit. But one of the reasons that it is important is because we can see the, re the response in the QRS to pacing. So if we're pacing the atrium, then we are for sure conducting down the AV node and the his Purkinje system. And so then the QRS morphology will tell us what the normal conducted QRS morphology ought to be. So David, when we look at the right panel, we see the paced rhythm. And on the left panel is the spontaneous rhythm. So based on the QRS morphologies, could you make a, a guess or an estimation regarding which of these two it is? Is this VT or is this JET? I would say that it's JET because it looks like the QRS duration does not change. Right. Not only does the duration not change, but the morphology is exactly the same, right? If you look in every single lead, the QRS looks exactly the same as in the spontaneous rhythm. And so this is an example of, uh, of pacing the atrium to demonstrate that the spontaneous QRS is the same as in the, um, in the um, paced rhythm. And that would give you, a, that would be a very uh, 
important clue to this diagnosis of JET. Now, there are many other reasons why pacing the atrium is of benefit, and we'll go over those in a moment, but I think it is also an important diagnostic clue because it allows us to compare the spontaneous to the paced rhythm, and therefore we know now that this is almost certainly not VT, okay, unless the VT was arising from an area immediately adjacent to the, um, the His bundle. The other thing that I think is important is, you know, we talked previously that when it comes to the rhythm of the heart, whatever is fastest wins. And so in this particular case or example, we're pacing the atrium at a rate faster than the junctional rate. And for that reason, we're in a paced rhythm. And so you can always control the rhythm if you can, <coughs> excuse me, pace the rhythm faster than the spontaneous rhythm. So let's go to the next slide here. So this is an example. On the right-hand side, we see the same patient in spontaneous rhythm. And on the left-hand side, <clears throat> we see the patient in atrial paced rhythm, and they're denoted uh, below. And um, Sergey, what do you notice in regards to the hemodynamics between the spontaneous and the atrial paced rhythm? Well, the blood pressure uh, hasn't changed. That's correct. Um, so what do you make of that fact? So I, you know, we know that in JET, we started this, uh, this mini lecture talking about how the lack of AV synchrony or ventricular atrial dissociation and the rapid rates often cause hemodynamic embarrassment but you've just appropriately noted the fact that the blood pressure really hasn't changed virtually at all, right? On both sides of the screen, they, I mean, maybe if we increase the uh, gain on this, we might see a, a three millimeter of mercury blood pressure difference, but I think you're absolutely right that they are largely the same blood pressure. So um, is that surprising to you? Mm, I, I guess not maybe <laughs> right. because there's a um uh i guess because the conduction is from the his uh bundle and it's a um kind of normal qrs now it's a normal depolarization for the ventricles it kind of provides the same cardiac output and if there is no dissociation with the atrium contraction maybe it's not affecting the well, I think um, I think I would I would respectfully disagree with that statement. And just saying that, I mean, you're right that his it does in jet you are going down the typical his Purkinje system. That's correct, but you do have oftentimes AV or VA dissociation, um, and that can result in hemodynamic embarrassment. And so. Uh, I apologize, this is a little bit of read my mind question, which is a somewhat unfair question. But what, what I'm trying to get at is the response to pacing is not always what one would expect. In other words, sometimes a pacing will improve the hemodynamic situation in a patient in JET. Other times it's not clear that there's a very substantial benefit. And so um, most of the time, I think it would be fair to say that if you A pace at a rate faster than the junctional rate, you will actually see an improvement in hemodynamics, including an improvement in blood pressure. But that is not always the case. And this is an example of that, where the blood pressure does not change very much. What would you say, however, about the right atrial pressure? Mm, right atrial pressure um, looks like Canon A waves. <laughs> That's exactly right. You have hit the nail on the head. Very good. So we're seeing Canon A waves, and uh, that is because, of course, in JET there is uh, there's not AV synchrony, mm -hmm. and so overall your right atrial pressure is substantially higher. Um, that is not good for you after uh, surgery, and oftentimes when you're uh, sitting at the bedside, always when someone is, when you're considering someone to be in JET or VT, the most important thing you can do, assuming the patient is stable, is to obtain a 12 lead EKG in order to look at it and try and surmise what the rhythm is. But sometimes when I'm at the bedside and I'm trying to decide if I think that, like if you look at the EKG and the spontaneous rhythm, you might be able to convince yourself that the T wave is in fact a P wave. 
with a long PR. That is not in fact the case, but I'm just making that as an example. And so what I will often do is look at the uh, central venous pressure, the CVP, oftentimes the right atrial line, which our surgeons are kind enough to place in most uh, post-op patients. And if I see that pattern that we're seeing on the right-hand panel of uh, these Canon A waves, then you can pretty much bet that the patient is um, actually not in sinus rhythm. And when you see this response in the right atrial pressure, you can pretty much guarantee that you were not in sinus rhythm before and that you are, with, that you are now in a better hemodynamic state with a pacing. And I think it's important to remember that, again, that although I would always try a pacing in virtually any jet patient, unless they're extremely fast, um, it is not 100% true that a pacing will improve the hemodynamics. I think most of the time it is likely true, but not always. So um, why don't we go to uh, Jenna? So Jenna, um, how would you treat a patient who is in jet? What are the ways that you, what is the most common way that you uh, have been improperly trained at Columbia to do? <laughs> so, um, so you can try sort of, you know, non-medical sort of conservative methods first. So like okay. lowering, making sure the patient is normothermic, mm -hmm. trying to limit your catecholamines that you're giving. So try and bring down your epi. Um, Mm -hmm. You um, can atrial pace them, um, sort of depending on how fast uh, their jet is. Mm -hmm. um, if, you know, you can pace like 10, a uh, heart rate 10 points higher or so, um, but keeping an eye on it to make sure their jet doesn't get faster throughout the night. Um, I agree with that. Well, every statement you've made thus far. Mm -hmm. um, and then if those... Um, uh, tactics don't work, you can try um, treating, normally would go to procanamide first is what we would use. Okay, and um, all right, so that was very good. Uh, uh, I, I liked everything you said except for the very last sentence and not because it isn't true, but because it wasn't <laughs> quite as accurate or, or as clear, but I'm gonna go over it now, but that was excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, so as Jenna said, there are basically two main approaches to how to manage jet. And as she very eloquently explained to us, the first thing we do in everybody is we try to minimize the inotropes. And sometimes that's a little non-intuitive because typically people in jet are in hemodynamic embarrassment, but uh, lowering the inotropic support, particularly epinephrine, dopamine, things of this nature are very helpful because Remember that these are automatic arrhythmias and any adrenergic tone is potentially going to um, make this worse. Um, you wanna maximize sedation. We don't want the patient to have any uh, internal adrenergic tone. So you want them to be as, as sleepy as possible. Um, you wanna normalize all the electrolytes, including the magnesium and the calcium. Now, quite frankly, I have no idea if that really makes a huge difference. I mean, I think it's a generally a good policy to have normal magnesium and calcium, and everybody always checks the electrolytes when any kind of arrhythmia occurs, but it is exceedingly rare that that is the problem in a fresh post-op patient, but it could be. Um, more recently, people have started using Presidex more commonly uh, as a sedative and also as a treatment for JED, and there are a handful of uh, papers in the literature suggesting that uh, Presidex reduces automaticity in the heart. I think that's pretty well established. One of the most common side effects of Presidex is actually sinus bradycardia, and it also has that similar effect on all cardiac tissues. So Presidex is never a bad idea in this circumstance. <coughs> most patients actually are on Presidex in the present era as it has become the treatment of choice for postoperative sedation, it seems, uh, in the U.S. at least. Uh, and it might, it might be interesting to know if, I would be interested to know if the incidence of JET has fallen in the United States since the administration or the use of uh, dexmedetomidine. Now, uh, that's true. For, so what I've just described, oh, and then normothermia. So as Jenna said, you want to get the patient to a normal temperature. And by normal, I mean 36 degrees. So Every centigrade. So everybody uh, always 
um, in pediatrics, we're trained, you know, to wait till someone hits to 38 before we call it a fever. We don't treat fevers until someone is 38 degrees. But the reality is any kind of fever at all, even a low-grade fever, can potentially stoke jet. And so you want to lower the temperature at least to a normothermic level. And so I would give acetaminophen uh, to anybody who has a temperature that is, uh, you know, in the 37, 5 and above range to try and get it down as maximally as possible without being um, too aggressive. Now, uh, after you've done all those things, and though all of those things should be done to anybody who has JET, because they're all very simple, they all carry very little risk. Uh, as Jenna said, you could atrially pace, but again, I'll, I'll remind you that sometimes atrial pacing does not actually have a very substantial improvement in the hemodynamics. I think most of the time it does, so it's always worth trying, but sometimes you have to do it almost as an experiment at the bedside and look at your RA pressure, look at your LA pressure if you have an LA line, and look at your blood pressure um, and maybe even your blood gases to see if cardiac output is improving. Once you've done all those things and you still don't have good control, then there are really two main approaches. And the first, uh, which uh, Jenna spoke about, is the so-called cooling plus procaine amide approach. And so in this approach, typically a patient is cooled to 35 degrees centigrade. And again, it's very important. <clears throat> it is hard, you have to be careful when you're cooling a patient. So when you're cooling someone, it's a very good idea to have a rectal thermometer in the patient that is continuously recording the temperature. It is challenging to get a patient cooled accurately to the temperature you want. In other words, you can over cool somebody. And that's the reason why having a continuous temperature probe is very helpful because if you cool very much further below 35, you will lower the fibrillatory threshold. In fact, cooling a patient is one of the ways that circulatory arrest is started is by cooling someone very, very aggressively down. I'll tell you a funny story. When I was a resident in pediatrics, I had actually, I had Natus's pediatric cardiology textbook and I was reading it every night because uh, I was interested in cardiology. And one night I was on call and I, I, I made a diagnosis of JET. And the ICU attendings who was on really didn't know much about JET. Uh, at that time, it was, I don't know, I guess it was a relatively novel diagnosis. This is back in like uh, 1991. And so uh, I called the cardiologist on call, who was this wonderful doctor named Kay Ehlers at Cornell. And she looked at the tracings that I faxed to her when we still faxed things. And she agreed that it was uh, JET. She was very, very good at EKG interpretation. And so I had read that the best way to treat this was to cool the patient. So what I did was I gastric lavaged the patient with ice water and I got the temperature down to like 32 degrees. And by the morning we had, you know, a slow junctional rhythm at like uh, 90. The patient was in good shape. But the truth is what I did was really horribly dangerous. Uh, first of all, you should never ice lavage someone uh, because it can cause terrible electrolyte abnormalities. Thankfully, I did not do that. But more importantly, I was probably on the cusp of fibrillation the whole night because I kept the temperature so low. It worked to control the rhythm, but I was probably a millimeter from inducing something far worse. So it's important to use, uh, the most common way we cool people is to use a cooling blanket, which can be adjusted. <laughs> But the, uh, the nurse at the bedside and the doctor on call need to be very careful and monitor the temperature continuously because you really don't want to go a whole lot below 35 degrees or you may find yourself with a different problem. And as Jenna said, we would atrially pace above the tachycardia rate. And then finally, uh, if that did not work, then we would give IV procainamide. And typically the dose is 10 to 15 milligrams per kilo over 45 minutes followed by a continuous infusion of 20 to 40 micrograms per kilo per minute. Now, um, some of you may listen to my podcast about, about a year ago, I had uh, Lizzie DeWitt on, who's an electrophysiologist at Boston Children's, and she spoke about IV procainamide and explained to me that in Boston, they give five milligrams per kilo in aliquots roughly every five to 10 minutes. Um, and they have found that 
uh, the hypotension that is commonly seen with IV procainamide is markedly reduced when you give it over like, actually, I think she said 10 to 15 minutes for five per kilo. And so what they do is they give five per kilo, they watch for a while, give another five per kilo, they end up probably on average giving about 15 per kilo. And most importantly, IV procainamide in this circumstance will not work unless the patient is cooled. You cannot give IV proc to a patient who is not cooled. I mean, you can, but it won't work. So it's the combination of cooling and IV procainamide that is effective. And it's important to remember that this approach, although not the most commonly used in the United States or in the world, and we'll go to the most common in a moment, um, is in fact the most effective. It has been demonstrated in a number of studies that it is the safest and the most effective. It has a lot of side effects, right? When you're cooling someone, you're having many effects on, on um, <clears throat> coagulation, you're affecting uh, enzymatic activity, you're affecting metabolic processes, you're probably prolonging intubation another day or two because after you cool someone, you have to wake them up. And so <clears throat> there's a lot of potential negative to it, but in terms of treating JET, this is actually uh, almost certainly the most effective approach. I see somebody just sent a, a little message in here. I just want to see what that message is. Uh, okay, and so Dr. Lozano uh, is asking whether we could use amiodarone. And so uh, he's jumping the gun to my next slide, which is that the second most common approach uh, is the use of uh, IV amiodarone. So again, in this circumstance, if we decided to take an amiodarone approach, we would minimize the inotropes, maximize sedation. We would normalize all electrolytes, including magnesium and calcium. Again, you would consider Presidex. Importantly, as opposed to procainamide, where you do need to cool the patient, IV amiodarone does not require uh, cooling of the patient in order to achieve control of the rhythm. Uh, however, <clears throat> It is certainly true though, that you would want the patient at the, at the least to be normothermic. So just as we talked about before, uh, you should try to keep the temperature in the range of about 36 degrees. And then um, typically the dosing is two to five per kilo over an hour, followed by continuous infusion of uh, 10 milligrams per kilogram per day. Now there are different doctors who will give uh, one per kilo per dose over, say, five or 10 minutes and, and look for a fact. Uh, for example, Tony Rossi at Miami Children's has told me that that's his preferred approach to using amiodarone. And he says that it's not uncommon that you can get away with much less than five per kilo as a dose to get control. Um, I, uh, I, that has not actually been my experience. And in fact, it's important to remember that most of the literature on IV amiodarone for the treatment of JET suggests that it works, but not very well. Uh, it's inconsistent, I think would be fair to say. Um, and most importantly, in small infants, uh, there is a very significant risk for cardiovascular collapse with amiodarone. There is a diluent, which amiodarone comes in, called tween 80, which is a uh, alcohol base. That's the way that amiodarone is prepared. And uh, patients can have an idiosyncratic reaction to it. Roughly two to three percent of infants, some under five percent, will have this reaction. And when it happens, they have complete cardiovascular collapse. And it is not uncommon that they might even need uh, mechanical support for that. So you want to be very careful. You want to give it very slowly. Monitor the hemodynamic response. Have calcium ready. Some people feel that IV calcium could be helpful in reversing that uh, response, but when it happens, it's quite a dramatic effect and it's very unpleasant. Um, and I would, are, and, and some people believe based on animal studies that continuous infusions of amio is suboptimal for boys. There's some evidence it could affect fertility in animal studies, um, having effects on, uh, on testicles. And so it might be worth giving it in, in, instead of giving a continuous infusion, perhaps giving it in say, 2.5 mg per kg per dose, maybe over two hours every six hours, something like that. Some people have done it that way to prevent that risk. I don't know if that's ever been studied in actual uh, true in, in human beings to be true. Generally, the rhythm is so dangerous that we sort of don't even think about it because we want to get the patient safe. 
Uh, and I would argue that we should probably never administer IV amiodarone unless you have ventricular pacing wires because, of course, amiodarone slows conduction and it can, in fact, cause heart block in some patients. Um, and so um, I think it's not safe to, to use it unless you have the ability to pace the ventricle because you might get such an effect that you will be too slow, actually. And you won't be able to A pace at a fast enough rate because of AV conduction abnormalities related to the effects of amio. Okay. So uh, this is another patient who uh, is in a uh, post operative arrhythmia. And uh, why don't I ask uh, Prerna, uh, what do you think this rhythm is? Hello, Dr. Pass. Hi, Prerna. I'm just looking through, give me a moment. Take your time. Of course, the ICU doctor is breathing down your neck, <laughs> desperately wanting to know the key to this question of what it is that we're looking at. Yeah, I don't see the, I don't see P waves in one, two, three, or anywhere actually for that matter. I would agree with that statement. Uh, of course, I wouldn't ask you to identify sinus rhythm, although I might. <laughs> I can be evil at times, but that's not what I would be trying to do. Um, and then the rate is like about 120-ish, I would Actually, say. Actually, it's faster than that. Uh, for some reason, whoever took this recording ran it at 50 paper speed, so it's, uh, oh. so it's actually closer to 200 beats 100. per minute. Um, and I and might add, I just want to say for the record, I am very opposed to doing that, just as a general rule. Mm -hmm. A lot of doctors feel that <clears throat> when they're at the bedside and they have an arrhythmia they're trying to identify, they will run the paper speed faster. Uh, I don't personally find that helpful. It always struck me as odd that people would do that because you're not used to the average doctor who's not an electrophysiologist is not used to looking at tracings at faster paper speeds. So at the most critical time in your life, when you're trying to make an important diagnosis rapidly, it seems like a bad time to look at the EKG in a different manner than you're used to looking at it all the time. So I would, I would dissuade you from this notion. But uh, anyway, that's, a, that's my editorial point for the day. Um, so yes, yeah, so I agree with you that this is a fast rhythm. I would agree with you that there is, uh, it's hard to see P waves. Um, and narrow complex. You believe it's narrow complex. Is this, let me, let me ask you if this were a, uh, a six month old tetralogy patient, is that the normal QRS for uh, that age? I think it actually is. It's not that wide, but uh, is the axis normal? What, how old is this patient? I mean, it's in the uh, left. Six act. months old, six months old. It's slightly left for the age. All right, so we're looking at a fast rhythm. There doesn't appear to be, it's not sinus. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you think this is? Or if you don't know what it is, what would you do to try and figure this out? Uh, if the wires are there, atrial wires, I would, uh, I could get an atrial electrogram and see. Okay. Uh, what if I told you that the atrial electrogram showed that there's a P wave on top of every QRS? And the rate is similar for P and Q? Like They're uh, exactly on time with the QRS. Every single QRS has a P wave. So it's like, I would say, mm, they're not this, like, yeah, but there's no like dissociation there. There's one to one association, but it's clearly not sinus, right? Because right. Um, so, I, the point I'm trying to drive home here is <clears throat> if this is a post up VSD, the most likely thing, right, is that this is jet. If I, jet. in other words, I don't have to show you any tracing. If I just said to you, I have a post op um, six month old after a VSD. They're not in sinus rhythm and the heart rate is 200, right? Statistically, you'd be right if you said jet most of the time. But uh, this, is an, this is what happened when we paced the patient in the atrium. 
<clears throat> so uh, what do you make of this? Is the QRS morphology the same in the pace rhythm? As in the, the spontaneous rhythm is on the left and the right sides of this uh, tracing. No, it has changed. It's changed. Are yeah. we conducting one-to-one -one with the pacing? Looks like uh, this is the, yeah, we're conducting. I agree with that statement. Um, yes. So what, what would you say this rhythm is if the QRS is not the same in paced rhythm? Uh, is this then jet? Check. Then it's VTAC. Right, then it's VTAC. Mm -hmm. Because uh, remember in jet, the, uh, the QRS, should be the same in the spontaneous rhythm and the A-paced rhythm. So pacing the atrium in this example has demonstrated that the patient actually uh, is not in a, a narrow QRS tachycardia. This is a wide QRS tachycardia with one-to-one -one VA conduction. And so this is actually VT. Now, it turns out that the treatment might be similar. You might give either procainamide or uh, amiodarone, um, but the bottom line is that this is formally, this would not be considered jet. This is actually a form of ventricular tachycardia. Okay. So let's just briefly uh, go over how we would do an electrogram at the bedside. So there are many, many different ways to do it. I think probably doing a unipolar bedside electrogram is, is usually the best because it gives us a much larger atrial electrogram. The important thing to remember is so when you're doing that, you would typically, uh, and there are many different ways you can do this, but I liked this little cartoon I found on the internet, and you can actually attach the, electri the uh, right arm, left arm, right leg, and left leg to the patient in the correct locations as usual. And then you can take either V1 or V2 and attach it directly to the, uh, through alligator clips to the ECG. And that will allow you, if you look in this little cartoon, a very large deflection uh, where the P wave is because uh, you're recording directly off the atrium. Now, if you're having difficulty, what's hard for a non-electrophysiologist is strange, right, to have the atrial signal be so much larger than the QRS signal. But again, it's because you're directly recording off the atrium. So it's important to run a multi-lead rhythm strip while you're recording because then you can look at the regular leads that you're used to looking at, such as in this case, example, lead one, and then you can uh, look down on them and remember everything is simultaneous. So if the QRS is here, then this is obviously uh, on the electrogram, the QRS, and the P wave is here, so that's the A wave, okay? So this patient is in sinus rhythm, and that's the simplest way and probably the most common way that people do electrograms. And this is an example of an atrial electrogram. And uh, what we're seeing here is, um, so we're looking at the QRS on the uh, surface electrocardiogram, and then we have these A's. And what we see is that the relationship of the V and the A is changing throughout the tracing. And so this is ventriculoatrial dissociation. And the rate of the V's is actually slightly faster than the rate of the A's. And so this is uh, either VT or JET. And again, if we wanted to distinguish the two, I said here it was jet, but if we wanted to distinguish the two, we, would, we could pace the patient at a rate faster than this rate and see whether the QRS morphology looks like this. And you can actually even see on the surface ECG that there is a change in the VA interval. In fact, <clears throat> I think what is actually happening here is we have so-called ventriculoatrial wanky box. So the VA, here's the retrograde P wave. We see that the VA interval is a little longer. The VA interval is a little longer still. VA interval longer still, longer still, and so on and so forth. So this is a ventriculoatrial uh, wanky box in the setting of uh, an accelerated junctional rhythm or jet. And this is typically what the uh, atrial electrogram looks like. And I'm, I think this is a nice example because it shows you how it sometimes can be challenging to know what's the V and what's the A on the tracing and why it's so helpful to have the ECG with the QRS morphology simultaneous. So in your mind's eye or just doing it with a ruler, 
you draw a line down so that you know, okay, that's the V. So something in between the two QRSs has got to be the A. So in this example, this is the V, this is the V. So this large deflection here is clearly the atrial depolarization. So. Okay, now for a completely unrelated topic, um, just to finish up our conference today, this is a tracing that one of our referring doctors sent to me uh, as a text message earlier last week. I'm going to ask uh, Neha, um, what do you think about this rhythm? The story was that this is a 14 year old who fainted at home and came to the emergency department. Hello? Yes, we can hear hi. you well. Okay, hi. Um, so the rhythm, uh, looking at it, uh, doesn't look, uh, so I'm looking at the rhythm sharply too. The first P has a very prolonged QR, PR, or if that's even a P or T. Uh, I think that's a T. Um, it's very weird. Um, so, and they're sort of group, but I don't know if this is actually Venky backing. I don't think so, because the first PR is prolonged, then the second one is narrow. Um, well, it's hard because I'm not giving yeah. you a rhythm strip and I wasn't given one either. But <laughs> I think if you look on the bottom here, I think this PR is getting longer. This is probably a T wave and a P wave superimposed on it. But mm -hmm. I think this PR is getting longer and then longer still and then one that drops. And again, the key, as you mentioned, is the presence of grouped beating. Group beating. Okay, so this is actually an example of Wanky Bach mm -hmm. conduction or so-called Mobitz one second degree heart block. And um, this patient had been out in the forest uh, the weekend prior. So what kind of mm -hmm. workup would you do for this patient? Um, so uh, with the forest, I'm thinking Lyme disease. Yes, um, that was a good that... hint I gave you. <laughs> um, but generally, like, I know the electrolytes usually don't matter, but you sort of do that. You do a thyroid workup. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, hypothyroidism Lyme. can affect the AV node for sure, yes. Um, and sometimes myocarditis can have AV node disease, so like troponins. Absolutely. Uh, and a SED rate or a CRP, right? Exactly. So all those tests were done and a Lyme titer was sent, but it's very common that you won't get a Lyme titer back in any type of a timely fashion. So uh, all the other tests were negative. And so the doctor started uh, ceftriaxone on this patient a priori. And mm -hmm. uh, this is the electrocardiogram after three days of uh, IV antibiotics and it normalized. And he explained to me on the phone on Friday that the Lyme titer three days later came back very positive. So this patient had Lyme mm. disease and responded to IV antibiotics. And so again, I think uh, as you rightly pointed out, Neha, the presence, when you see group beating, you wanna at least ask yourself, is it possible that this could be um, wanky buck? It's not a guarantee, but it's a very often an association with it. And I agree, it's hard to know if this is the T wave or the P wave, but I think if you look at this beat, for example, and then you look at this, this is probably a T wave with this P wave on top of it. Mm -hmm. All right. As if this was not Lyme and you had this finding. Um, yes. What would we do? Like we'd well, I mean, it, at, it would be yeah. one of these things. So if the thyroid levels were low, I would give uh, Synthroid. If mm -hmm. uh, the patient had myocarditis, you could give either uh, IVIG or steroids, depending upon your religion. Mm -hmm. uh, if the patient, you know, this, so there's all kinds of ways that you could potentially manage this. Since all the other testing was negative, mm -hmm. um, the thought was. Also, it happened that where the patient had been spending that weekend was uh, apparently, I didn't know this, though he explained this to me, it was a very common area for Lyme disease lately. Mm. That area is Staten Island, New York, which I had no idea had a high incidence of Lyme disease, but apparently, at least at the present time, it does. Mm 
All right. Thank you all very okay. much. I uh, hope you found this of use. And uh, we'll be back uh, hopefully next week. Uh, I'll see you in a little while, guys. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.